Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, joint webinar uh, between LIBA and the EOS Pilot uh, Project uh, on the topic of skills and training and open science and the EOS ecosystem with a particular focus on libraries and researchers. Uh, my name is Kevin Ashley. Uh, I'm director of the Digital Curation Center. Uh, I'm going to be managing uh, the, the, the handover today between uh, the speakers, introducing you to the speakers uh, and dealing with the Q&A session at the end. Uh, the agenda today, hopefully you've all seen it, uh, includes Jerry Jabris uh, uh, of Dance, who's going to talk about the work that's been going on uh, in the EOS pilot uh, project, and then uh, a panel introduced uh, by Cecile Sviatek uh, of Libra talking about the, the work of the Libra Working Group uh, on digital skills for library staff and researchers, and that includes Thorsten Mayer, Karen Clavel, and Hannah Grabermovic. Uh, and then we'll move on, hopefully in the final 50 minutes or so, uh, to a question and answer session, some closing remarks. You can raise questions at any point uh, during the proceedings today using uh, the, the, the chat function, uh, and I'll try and gather them up uh, and then present them uh, to, to the speakers uh, towards the end. Uh, so just um, some housekeeping notes. This webinar is uh, being recorded. You all get a link uh, to the recording later on today uh, that can be shared. The slides are already available uh, on, on Zenodo. And as I mentioned, you can put your questions uh, in the chat box uh, at any time. So at this point, I'll hand over uh, to our first speaker this morning, uh, Jerry de Vries uh, of Dance. Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Kevin. I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Uh, my name is Jerry de Vries. I'm working at Dance, as Kevin already said. I'm working as information scientist and project lead. And I'm going to talk about the framework of fair data stewardship skills for science scholarship, or simply, as we call it, fair for s uh, This morning, I will give an introduction of the fair for s framework by introducing the core elements of the framework and show an example of how the model has been evolved based on feedback from the community that we received in September and last month. FairFRS was drafted during the pilot project of the European Open Science Cloud and aims to help you and your organization to identify the capabilities and skills required to ensure research objects are fair and that these objects stay fair. FairFRS aims to describe skills to provide stewardship of research objects by linking skills to competences required for stewardship and research objects, whereby data stewards are a member of research team or research organizations working in open science or a data science environment, and the data steward is capable of operating or providing a service of the EOS. To produce fair research output, the support of data stewards are essential. Within the EOS pilot stewardship is defined as the formalization of roles and responsibilities and their application to ensure that research objects are managed for long-term re reuse and in accordance with the FAIR principles. A competence describes an ability a data steward can acquire and apply as a skill. A capability describes what happens when data stewards apply the skills together in a team or organization using a service or enabling this to others to do so. The framework we have developed is drawn from existing models. We have not reinvented the wheel, but we have reused the essential elements of these existing models presented on this slide and brought them together in the FairFresh framework. The FairFresh framework describes skills groups. These are high-level categories representing the competences and capabilities including in the framework. There are two broad categories. In the inner circle, we have the thematic competence and capabilities described according to a typical research life cycle. In the outer circle, we have the generic competences and capabilities, capabilities which are applied in project independent and cross domain ways. For example, advising others on how to do fair research and managing the enabling infrastructure. Research performing organizations employ a wide range of professional staff to support researchers. Data stewards are becoming established as a professional group and other groups, including researchers themselves, will need some level of expertise on data stewardship. fair for s sees the data steward role as combining a data management or creation function with at least one other role like research or data science engineering. 
The framework can be used to identify and describe the competences and learning materials that match the capabilities data stewards or your organization need. It offers core competences for data stewardship relating topics to expertise level for researchers and the professional groups that support them. The framework offers examples of capability and competence statements, focusing these on identified skills gaps. The high level skills groups are broken down into competences and capabilities. Competences and capability statements examples are given for selected topics. Competence statements are described at three levels, the comprehend level, the basic level shown in this diagram by the open circle, the apply level, it's the intermediate level shown by the half circle in this diagram, and synthesis and evaluate the expert level shown by the black dots in this diagram. The capability statement for the same topic has two levels, research team or organization. This example shows a minimum level representing a basic undergraduate level knowledge of data stewardship. This is based on the existing data information literacy, literacy matrix. The other main source for the competence listed is the Edison data science framework. As relevant skills will change rapidly, Fair4S offers organizations the dimension and examples they can adapt for their own purposes, rather than a comprehensive set of off-the-shelf competence and capability statements for every topic conceivable. Fair4S can help EOSC services Providers specify the skills and capabilities involved in using the service, or it can help EOS service users to identify learning resources for their own professional development, or it can help to plan skills for their organization. From the online survey, we drafted, uh, sorry, for, from the all, on, online survey, the draft version of the Fair for S has received feedback. Almost all respondents agree on that the common EOS framework of skills and competences for data stewards will help researchers and support professionals to implement fair and secure data principles. And 64% agrees that the fair S framework will help promote education for data stewardship, expert and their reward for recognition. However, most re respondents think fair S is too difficult to apply in current form for any of the use cases. Therefore, more workshops and discussions are needed and to provide more feedback in and improve the fair for S framework. Feedback was received during the workshop held at the Technical University in Delft on the 26th of September this year. This workshop responds to the open science policy platform recommendations of the European Commission and other stakeholders on em embedding open science. The aim of the workshop was to take a step forward aligning open science skills that researchers need at their different career levels with the skills that data stewards and other need to support them. During the workshop, a short list of 10 key skills for open science were identified and formed the input for the four breakout groups. Each group identified which open science skills are relevant to researchers at their assigned career stage and how support staff can provide training or assistance for researchers to properly develop and apply those skills. At this point, me and Angus want to thank TU Delft colleagues from the data steward team and especially Marta Tepere for the selection of the 10 skills we are reframing the model around now and future feedback from your side is highly appreciated. During the workshop, three to four key skills per career stage were identified. In the breakout groups, the following topics were discussed per key skill. The relevance of this skill for the career stage, what the evidence of practice this skill is, and how researchers should be supported to apply this skill. This had led to the following overview of key skills per career stage. As mentioned before, only the key competences were discussed and blanks in the table can be filled in after further discussion. The table also shows the full research career stage, which are the first stage, researcher, the researcher up to the point of the PhD level, the recognized researcher, a PhD holder, but not yet fully independent, an established researcher, researchers who have developed a level of independence, and leading researchers, which are researchers leading in the research field. This table highlights the level of expertise for each career stage following the same principles as described in the Fair4S framework. And the outcome of the workshop led to reframing the Fair4S and, the described, and describes a research profile for organizations to self-assess. It describes three key, key skills per career stage and gives indicators to measure if a skill is applied or not and what the supporting roles are and skills these supports needed. needed. At the moment, Fair4S offers profiles for each research career stage and recommend, recommends key skills per stage. 
An explanation why the skill is needed at this stage is added together with an overview of the supporting roles and their skills. In total, this gives a list of 10 key skills relevant for data stewardship, competences and capabilities. This framework will form the basis for successor ES projects and to receive more feedback, the online survey will be open till next Monday by following the link on the slide. I want you to thank everybody for their attention and I'm giving it back now to Kevin. Thanks very much, Jerry. There's a lot uh, in that. I'll remind you all, if you have any questions uh, on any of this, put them uh, into to, to the chat box and we'll pick them up uh, at the end of the presentations. Uh, but now I'd like to hand over to Cecile, uh, who's going to describe the work that Lieber has been doing uh, in this area. Take it away. And do you need to unmute? We can't hear you, Cecile. Um, so we apologize for this brief uh, interruption. I wonder if the other members of the working group perhaps could uh, just come in at this point and introduce the work uh, they've been uh, doing uh, and, and, and take us through the next few slides. So Thorsten, are you there and can you? Yeah, hello from my side. Um, I try to give a um, short introduction, but maybe um, it's more to get on the next slides. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the German perspective. Here it is that um, the Alliance of Science Organizations, um, which is a um, organization of all the huge university groups and uh, science associations like Fraunhofer, Helmholtz, and so on. Um, they have launched and they are working together on um, all the information, digital information. They launched an initiative already in 2008. And in 2018, um, this um, initiative was, uh, they had a new focus on digital transformation. So in the first years, for example, uh, we established an, a standard for licensing in combination with open access, just one of the different uh, many um, tasks we had. Now it's this focus on digital transformation. Um, it's very important to have this close cooperation between universities and non-university institutions. And uh, there are several um, working groups like digital tools, software and services, digital collections of data and text corpora, digital learnings, um, teaching and networking, and digital qualified staff. The focus is not only on, um, on research data management, which is uh, the, maybe the most important um, not important, but the most uh, challenging um, issue at the moment um, in research and in libraries and information uh, centers as well. But um, we are looking for the, in this digital qualified staff working group, it's um, that we look what digital qualified staff is needed. So it's, it's not only um, the research data management, it's uh, software programming, it's um, media literacy, it's um, digital communication, collaboration, and so on. And um, we see the science as a catalyst for innovation. And so that science and um, information infrastructures could shape the digital transformation of science itself. So to, to uh, not only to react, but to, to act actively. And um, our working group at the moment focuses on the identification of needed digital qualifications and expertise. We are trying to uh, work on a collection of competences, um, how to bring these competences into a system for a research cycle, for um, for uh, for the different um, 
uh, subjects and disciplines and the work just started but this is a it's one of the um, initiatives in Germany but um, as it is a very broad um, cooperation between all academic institutions in Germany it's a very important thing thank you Thank you, Thorsten. So I think now we're moving on to uh, Karen Klavel. Thank you. Hello, this is uh, Karen Klavel from TU Delft Library in the Netherlands. I would like to tell you something about the Open Science MOOC we developed at TU Delft. It has just finished its first run on the edX platform. Before I continue, I would like to add that I'm joined by my colleague Nicole Will, who was responsible for launching the MOOC and was actively involved as one of the instructors. For anyone not familiar with the term MOOC, it stands for Massive Open Online Course. In the Netherlands, and particularly in Delft, we want to be front runners in the transition to open science. And for a couple of years, we did an open science roadshow where library staff visited research departments to tell and explain about open science. The roadshow generated lots of interest, interest but also lots of questions by the research community. People said, we want to know more. Can you organize a course or a training? So we developed a modular online course for the TU Delft Graduate School, aimed at postgraduates, PhD candidates, as we call them, which launched next year, last year. And in this course, we worked together with open data researcher Anneke Zuiderweg, and she contacted us with the idea to turn the course into a MOOC. And so we did, it took us about five months. We had to re-record all the videos which were specifically attuned to the Delft situation and now had to be relevant to a worldwide audience, but we could reuse the scripts. We developed new exercises and assignments and we were fortunate to work with Annika who had run a MOOC before. You can see the link on the slide that uh, will take you to the, the content description of the MOOC. And it consists of four, uh, five modules, four mandatory and one optional. It runs in four weeks. It is not self-paced because we wanted participants to collaborate and to interact. So for example, in the first week, we asked them to do an interview and all of the interviews together form a data set, which is then used in the exercises of the second week, etc. You can find a detailed description of the contents of the course and all the modules on the edX.org platform, where you can also take a look at the course syllabus. The first run started on the 30th of October, so it's all very fresh. But we have some results. We are very satisfied in our goal to increase the open science community. More than 1,100 people enrolled of which about 19% were actively engaged in the MOOC. Participants are mostly from the Netherlands, from the USA, UK, Spain, Germany, Sweden, and also India. And while aimed at researchers, a lot of librarians participated also. We are still in the process of collecting all the participants' input, both from the discussions and from the assignments. People shared motivations for getting involved interested observations from the interview they had to do in week one. They shared social media strategies in week three. We learned a lot. For example, that there's a lot of confusion about hybrid journals and gold open access publishing. So what's next? There definitely will be a rerun of this MOOC, but we don't have a date yet. We'll let you know when we have a date for an, a new run. Um, questions, I think, at a later moment. So now over to Hanne graver -Mürich. Hello. My name is uh, Hanne graver -Mürich, and I'm the library director at the University of Oslo, as I have been since uh, September 2017. First of all, I will uh, quickly guide you through how open science looks like for the moment in uh, Norway, on a national level and on a local level at the UIO, University of Oslo. 
and also how we plan to face these challenges, both on developing policy and also how to develop cross-disciplinary services. This is challenging to our organization in new ways. And of course, we need uh, the need for knowledge and the competences are high on the agenda. But first of all, in uh, 2017, the government released the national guidelines for open access in Norway. Finally, we had the political will we needed to anchor our local policies and also to be able to make uh, long-term plans. I have attached the link above. As you all know, Plan S was released in September 2017 and the government and the Norwegian Research Council has committed Norwegian universities to the principles in the following plan for implementation. There has been uh, published quite a lot uh, of articles in the national press about the plan and its contents. We now have two hearings coming up. Norwegian Research Council welcome all units in higher education to contribute to developing a new policy on open science. And there are three issues to be discussed. One, open research processes. The library is involved in this one. And uh, number two, open innovation and involvement. Number three, user involvement and citizen science. And also coming up, is a hearing on Plan I, how to implement Plan S. Higher education in Norway on all levels are heavily engaged in these issues as we speak. I move forward to uh, institutional network. I will comment on the last uh, bullet point. At the University of Oslo, which is a large university, 28,000 students and 7,000 employees, these are the following main units working with research support today. Both units in the administration and the faculties are involved. So I have put down a list of tasks managed by the library today, working closely with other units and also in collaboration with the faculties and other communities who have a special interest in the field. I think these are well known. Uh, I move on to comment on the two last bullet points. I think uh, the best way to explain the concept of Research Services Center is to describe what's happening with our organization concerning IT services and digitalization. Research support is changing we use the term digital scholarship centers or research service uh, centers to describe the goal. The main goal is not to develop a large unit consisting of defined support needs, but to, uh, to create some kind of an, an hub, maybe in the library that connects the other communities at the university together. We believe that the researchers do need to have the support nearby or in the faculty. Even the library in some cases will be defined to be too far away. But the hub can be located in the library. And uh, to be a bit more specific, the University of Oslo is a member of a global community called the Software, uh, Software Carpentry. And this is all about sharing skills it's a global community teaching software and data skills to researchers to help scientists and uh, engineers get more research done in less time and with uh, less pain by teaching them basic skills for scientific computing. And even there is also a library carpentry. The point is to offer organized support adapted to an organization in transformation and collecting the existing services from the library and combine these already existing communities that are mm -hmm. out there established by the faculties and the scientists themselves and uh, the hub will then be uh, representing a coordinated support focusing on digital skills for researchers from the idea to publishing 
I'm uh, I'm happy to forward a link to the workshops for the Research Bazaar at the 2019 in January uh, to give you an idea of the contents and the skills in focus in the workshops. So now I'm uh, handing over to Kevin again. Thank you. And just before we move uh, to the questions, we're going to make one another attempt to go back to Cecile, who was having microphone troubles uh, at the beginning of this session about Libra. Cecile, are you with us? Yes, I think I. you can hear me now. Excellent, we can, yeah. So if you want to say what you want to do, I think to, to, to summarize why Libra engaged with this and, uh, and, and, and what the working group is up to. Absolutely. I have the pleasure to co-chair with Susan dasgaard Krag from Denmark, the Working Group on Digital Skills for Library Staff and Researchers. This is a very recent group created last year, um, and uh, we are uh, uh, we have um, uh, the idea that the um, changing world we have uh, right now um, asks for library to regularly reassess our existing services toward researchers, but also about our own skills and competencies. With the advance of open science in particular, this meant for us a reinvention of models of way of working, techniques and skills. So for us, this raised many questions. Some of them were tackled today by Thorsten Mayer, Karen Claver, and Hannah Graver Movig, all three members of the working group. And we are heading now towards a selective uh, map for um, institutions involved in open science trainings and um, skills programs in Europe. And we think that for tomorrow, we have to handle two things at the same time, um, training trainers in libraries and training researchers, either young or senior researchers, always in partnership, like today, for example, with EOSC. Many thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Cecile. So I think that gives us a, a, a good idea of your, your motivation uh, for uh, Libra. Uh, trying to to coordinate work uh, in in this area. Uh, I remind everyone you can put questions uh, in in the chat. So far, we've seen a lot of links uh, to to background content coming from Libra. So before some questions turn up there, I have one. Uh, really, I think directed um, at uh, initially, I think those uh, from from Libra. So I know your work in the working group. Uh, as, as Thorsten made clear, is, is looking at skills in a much broader area than, uh, than data stewardship. Um, but nonetheless, clearly we, uh, I think in the EOS pilot, are interested in whether you feel frameworks such as those uh, being developed by the EOS pilot help you as libraries uh, in your missions to, to bring skills to people and to do that train the trainer work that Cecile just referred to. So the question really is, do you find those frameworks helpful or do you feel that you already have enough knowledge within the libraries uh, to, to do these things yourselves? Uh, this is Karen from TU Delft. I think yeah. it's uh, definitely very interesting to look at uh, different frameworks. As you said, the focus of the Libre Working Group is uh, kind of broad. Um, we cannot think of everything ourselves. So if there's work already being done, then uh, it's it's really useful to look at that and to see how we can incorporate that. So from my point of view, uh, yes, definitely very interesting, and uh, I'm sure we'll take a look at the framework in more detail and see how we can uh, how we can use that in our group. Okay. Torsten here um, from ZBW. Um, I would like to support that. Uh, it's very good to have uh, frameworks. Um, it all works only together, not, um, you know, everybody does something as a library or researchers. It's more a cooperation between all parts of the scientific area. Mm -hmm. And I think that that leads me to uh, uh, a follow-up question there. I think the, the observation you made there, Thorsten, about Collaboration. I know uh, in, in, in our work with uh, research organizations of many types trying to, to, to build up skills, libraries are, are key players 
in in doing this. But I think uh, it's not always the case, and they can work alone. Different organisations are, are are structured in in different ways. Uh, I wonder if any of you can give examples of. Do you find the need to collaborate with other professional groups to build up these skills, and if so, who they might be? And I'm seeing some questions beginning to appear in the chat now, and we'll we'll turn to those in a moment. But are the just asking the Libra group? Do you are the exact for example? Do you find you have to work with colleagues from from IT uh, or those involved in the the training of early career researchers within the research domains to achieve your ends here? Um, Thorsten here, I would say yes. Um, the IT is uh, more and more um, important. And mm -hmm. uh, to bring this together, it doesn't just work uh, the librarians do or the libraries do data curation yes but um, it's more than just um, doing the data curation it's a technical part as well so the the combination of everything and to to um, side this with um, uh, the education even of uh, future librarians but of future researchers and so on so there is the direct connection but um, to bring this into other programs as well so that um, at the moment for, for from my view it's very important to to bring the competences to train the trainer to the um, education to the university to the um, studies for librarians but for other parts as well that um, we don't have to do this the new task in our own, but that we have a, a framework, um, a broader framework to, to get um, things done and to get the best um, training for the trainers and for the, re for the research in the open science context. Okay, thanks very much, Thorsten. So I'll, I'll turn now to uh, some of the questions that are coming up in the chat. So first, not so much a question, but uh, on observation there from Joy Davidson, uh, uh, who's involved in the Foster Plus project uh, and has drawn our attention to the work they've been doing on building skills uh, in, in, in open science. Uh, I can say to Joy, I know certainly the work that's been going on in EOS Pilot has been informed by that. There's a fair overlap, in fact, between people involved uh, in, in, in the two projects. And that's one of the inputs uh, that, that we've been looking to build on. I think, as, as Jerry said in the is, is opening slides, we, we wanted as much as possible to reuse work done by others. But now I'll turn to a question from Luke Henry, which I think is really directed towards Hannah. I don't know if you've seen this in the chat. Uh, is interested in this hub model that you, uh, you envisage at Oslo. Um, having difficulties convincing management, his own institution, about the, the, the wisdom of doing this. Uh, and he'd like some more details. Is there a, a white paper you can share anything about how it's funded or the skills profiles of your team, its governance structure, et cetera. So Hannah, can you, can you help Luke here convince uh, people at EPFL to follow your model? Um, I haven't seen the question, but uh, I will try to answer from what you, uh, how you described it. Uh, I can explain a bit more to give you some idea of the framework. Uh, the university is uh, working on an uh, overall strategy now for uh, for IT for the university and this is very complex uh, work. Uh, normally uh, this would be a type of work that the IT department would, uh, would be in charge of but what's interesting here is that uh, this whole process is managed by deans and uh, rector and also uh, uh, the, I the director of the IT services. So I think this is a signal of how we need to, to collaborate because this is challenging our organization, but uh, somehow it's also, um, um, it's also uh, a good way to, uh, to collaborate in different ways, the administration and also the faculties. Uh, we, have, uh, we have not finished this work yet, so, but I can try to look into if there is uh, some uh, some information and documents that I can uh, share. I think so that this is just a, it's it's a, the idea of the hub 
of the library being the hub and the, the other communities are out at the faculties it's more a concept an idea uh, so it's not uh, it's not uh, organized uh, or coordinated properly yet okay but it sounds as if you you offer to share some documents there that's certainly what luke uh, was looking for although it sounds as if since luke described his real challenge so far has been convincing management of the wisdom of your approach you sound as if you've already got over that barrier you say you, you it, it's the deans uh, and other senior uh, decision yeah. makers who are driving this forward therefore you you've clearly that that that's quite a big barrier i think often to get that management buy in and you've already uh, uh, achieved that um so i'm sure others will, will will want to to learn from that example and perhaps point uh, to 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 that example um I'll just pick up some other points again, not so much questions that have come up uh, in the chat. Uh, we've already mentioned the work being done by Foster in this area. Ellen Lennart has drawn attention to similar work uh, in, in, in open air. Again, I know there's a significant overlap um, between uh, the, uh, the members of the, 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 the different groups uh, in um, in EOS Pilot and in Open Air working on skills. So I hope uh, there that, that Open Air will be, be, be picking up uh, on that work. It's certainly, you know, we can't afford to get too much duplication uh, in this area. And Celia's drawn some attention to something um, being done at Purdue. And, and uh, Angus White, who's here with me, um, who did a great deal of the work uh, on, on that. Uh, framework for EOS Pilot says, in fact, that work at Purdue was one of the sources uh, we drew on uh, in developing uh, our own framework. So again, any further questions for any of the presenters? If not, uh, at the moment, I have uh, another. So clearly, one of the reasons organizations like LIBA exist uh, is to to share experience and where possible to act collectively, I guess, to achieve things that your members individually uh, may find difficult to do uh, yourselves. So I wonder from, we, we've heard at least a couple of the presentations from the working group about things that have happened within their own institutions or in groups of institutions. How much potential do you think there is for LIBA members to, to really reuse approaches uh, and work uh, from different institutions uh, in their own? Or is this something where the problem needs to be solved again uh, in every single library that, that, that needs to, to tackle it? Well, Cecil speaking, mm -hmm. um, we have the two levels at the same time. It's interesting for the libraries to see what happens in other countries, other institutions. Inside the working group in Liber for digital skills, we have people coming from uh, various horizons. And every time we meet or we exchange, we exchange good practices, but also tips and in general information on what's happening in our countries and institutions. And from this uh, teams some, um, come some ideas uh, for what we can do in our own country. For example, I'm living in France and we have a very young open science committee who is working also on skills and we are going to be rich with what we hear from other experience and other countries. We can build our own policies and in each institution, then we can decline it because the local point of view also has to be taken into account. So that's an alchemy, really, between the uh, European horizon, national policy, and institution specifics. I think that's a very good way of phrasing that that uh, that difficult challenge, Cecile, as you say, that uh, alchemy, the blending uh, be, be, between the international, the national, and the uh, and the local. Thank you. So another reflection I have, which is uh, really related to our concerns in, in, in EOS Pilot. So the EOS Pilot project is 
going to be drawing to a close in the next few months and its job was partly to to begin to examine the many issues that the establishment of EOS, the European Open Science Cloud, was going to face. And there are now a number of other projects taking that work forward. There are formal governance boards and a stakeholder forum is being set up. This was all formally launched uh, in Vienna uh, at an event uh, a couple of weeks ago. Some of you may well have been there. And I know one of the questions that was asked there was how individual research organizations could really engage with EOSC. I think there's been a lot of discussion about uh, how the large research infrastructures and the infrastructures are going to work together to deliver this. But as many of us know, um, a great deal of the data that's going to form part of EOS, the individuals, are members of individual institutions. And, and whether it's in developing skills uh, or in managing content, the institutions have a significant role um, to, to play here. So I wonder if observations from, from any of the panelists, from, from Jerry or, or, or from those uh, in Libra, about how, what would you see as institutional roles within EOSC? And I see a comment here in the chat as well from, from Garrett, but I'll, I'll take observations from the panelists first and then return to Garrett McMahon's point. So hearing no immediate response uh, from the panelists about how you might uh, engage uh, with um, EOS. Garrett has made a, Garrett McMahon in the chat has made a specific point about library engagement, saying that there can be a lack of engagement at a senior level to support a realignment of library services towards open science support. Um, and although I think that can be true, we've heard a, a number of examples today of institutions where that's clearly not the case uh, from, from, from Oslo, where there's clearly senior management buy-in to the realignment that's happening there. And from Delft, uh, where I know the, the, uh, the reason why there are 10 data stewards and a growing number there was because senior decision makers saw the, the, the value of this. So I guess the question is, how can we take this approach from these institutions where that senior buying has taken place and how can we learn from that and get that buy-in to happen at, at, at other organizations where senior management may not be so aware well Cecil speaking mm -hmm. um, we had a, a workshop with Foster and the same kind of question popped up last uh, summer and uh, the participants to this workshop with the working group in Liber uh, concluded uh, one point is that um, we need ambassadors within senior management. It means someone who is convinced first and who is largely recognized in the science field. But what we know is that for convincing senior management, you have two things to take into account. Is the person who is your ambassador is he known in his community for being an open access or uh, open science fighter himself because he published so much? He knows he needs to go toward this. And in this case, you need to know if the other senior management are uh, against this point of view or this kind of positions or not. And the second conclusion we had is that if you have an ambassador, uh, inside senior management, you need him to or her to draw uh, with him all uh, his new uh, young researchers because they are going to be the next ambassadors and they are going to convince other senior management by rebound. So the thing is that you can't go uh, with everybody, but you need to pick and choose someone who is going to uh, push these ideas forward and bring along young researchers too. Indeed, and, and I know that the, the 
the other key thing I think um, for effecting that sort of change is to be able to move from that individual ambassador uh, who, who is key certainly to starting things to buy in from the, the management team so that we're not dependent uh, on the on the enthusiasm of that one ambassador. We've certainly seen some initiatives fail in some organizations where it's been driven by the, the enthusiasm of one person. When that one person moves on to another job, suddenly you discover that the organization itself never really uh, bought in to those ideas. Whereas in other cases, ambassadors, you hope, work to convince others uh, and the effect survives uh, their departure. So I see another question from Celia van Gelder is uh, referring to, I mean, she's mentioned Elixir as an example, but I think this is a more general question about uh, research infrastructures that are dealing with specific domains, many of whom have already been doing a good deal of work in, uh, in developing skills uh, to use this distributed infrastructure they're building. And she's asking how can it connect up to the follow-up work uh, that will go on when EOS Pilot ends. So I wonder, uh, Jerry or Angus, do you have any um, reflections uh, on that particular point? I was just about to uh, click send on a, on a reply to that. Just, just, just saying, uh, we'd love to get Elixir's in, input to the final draft of our framework because we're developing these researcher profiles and, and we want to make sure we we link them to the right uh, support skills and um, you know Elixir has a great deal of experience in, in uh, practicing that and yeah we'll, we'll be in touch and um, also with anyone else who um, is, is also interested because this is the focus of, of the last uh, part of our project. Okay. And I see two further comments that have come up in the chat. Uh, one uh, about sustainability uh, of project funded um, initiatives. I mean, which is, uh, a, a, as we all know, a general problem. Foster's looking at this. Uh, EOSC uh, certainly uh, has similar challenges if we've got waves of projects uh, all meant to be building on the the, the, the work of others there's a, a again an observation from Celia that uh, one thing that may help with this to an extent is a community of practice uh, of training organizations training organizers and coordinators uh, that's deliberately intended to cross over all these different projects and initiatives and bring together the groups of people who are working on similar problems, however, they're being funded. Now, I don't know um, how much this is particularly focused on projects and whether the people involved in the LIBA working groups are aware of that community of practice and whether they feel it'd be useful to engage with it. I think it would. Um, I don't know, again, do the LIBA panelists, are you aware of this? Uh, and is this something you feel you could uh, engage with as organisations? Uh, in this particular case, I wasn't aware of the, the elixir, I think, uh, what she mentioned. Um, but I'm, you know, it, this is the part where the, in the Libra working group, where we're still kind of um, trying to uh, find out about all these things that are already existing. So any input, I think, will be uh, uh, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I know most of these initiatives uh, are being driven by organizations, many of whom are themselves LIBA members. So I wonder if this is, I, I know even in the organization I'm part of, there's not always as good enough, good communication as there should be between the different parts uh, of, of, of the university. Uh, and I'm sure that problem is replicated uh, elsewhere. So, um, and I see Irina Kushmer has put in a link in the chat to that community of practice uh, workspace. So this is the community of practice that's meant to bring together training coordinators, uh, whatever project they're involved in or whatever organizations they're in, in engaged with. Uh, so hopefully that can be useful for Libra to reach uh, a 
a greater community uh, of of people. So now a lot gone past in the chat there. Some of it uh, response. Another thing, uh, yet another initiative that that Celia has mentioned. Um, Go train. So first, I guess I'd ask how many of the speakers on this call are aware of the Go Train initiative and what uh, it involves? Because if we aren't, then the follow up question is going to be rather difficult to ask. I'm taking that silence as a um, lack of awareness. Maybe um, just, I think, um, then we come back to the question you had, Kevin, um, and we didn't uh, react uh, before. It mm -hmm. is how are, there are different levels, um, like um, EOSC is maybe seen more as a political level, but now it's going into content as well. Then um, Go Fair is uh, more... Uh, should be or is seen as a, a bottom-up uh, um, initiative, and uh, it's getting momentum. So um, the Go Train um, is a good platform as well. Um, I'm not that much into the um, specifics of Go Train, um, but um, the Go Fair initiative is a good uh, way to bring things easier together, maybe than via EOSC. So it's a good combination. Yeah. I mean, for, for those who aren't aware, my understanding certainly of what's happening in GoFair is it's bottom up in only in the sense that it's trying to coordinate actions at national level rather than at continental level, uh, as, as, as EOSC is. And it's trying to provide that link between what's being funded and organized within individual member states and what's being done uh, at European level and ensure that those two things work in synergy. Uh, and maximize each other's work rather than work in a discoordinated way uh, or against uh, each other. So certainly there's roles there for, for Libra members to play in, in ensuring that any national actions are, are, are coordinated uh, more broadly with, with, with things funded uh, at, at European or indeed we, we know some examples that we, we touched on in the EOS pilot work uh, things that are funded at, at, at global level through groups such as the, the Belmont Forum. Well, we're running near to the end of our allotted hour in this webinar. Um, and unless there are any really urgent questions uh, to, to, to address here, uh, I'd, um, I'll say a few words, hopefully summarizing what we've, we've heard. And, uh, and then I'd like to offer my thanks uh, to, to, to everyone involved. So we've seen one part of what's been going on in this project EOS Pilot. A great deal of the risk of, of what EOS Pilot has been doing has focused either on more technical issues to do with making infrastructures work together or political issues involving things like governance and policy in the European Open Science Cloud. But there was a recognition when the project began that all of these things will fail if we don't have sufficient people with the right skills, uh, both to, to manage data, to curate data, and to be able to reuse data effectively to build uh, the sorts of research ecosystems uh, that the vision uh, of EOS uh, sets out. So you've seen uh, the extent to which the project has, in, in, in one area, focused on trying to define those skills, particularly focusing on the data stewards, the people who, to whom individual researchers will hand over responsibility for the data before hopefully that data is then reused uh, in another context, either in research or elsewhere. And those data stewards will often, but not always, uh, be situated in uh, libraries uh, or the parts of organizations that are closely tied to libraries. So therefore, it's, it's opposite that we've seen that Libra as part of a broader set of work on examining how the change in requirements on digital skills is going to impact on libraries, both on how you're going to be training your own staff and on the responsibilities of library to train those elsewhere in the universities to bring them up uh, to speed with the digital skills that they're going to need to work not just today, uh, but in the future. 
we've heard about specific initiatives within uh, national areas, within uh, individual uh, universities, uh, and about at least one tool, an open science MOOC, that has the potential to have impact way beyond uh, the university it was originally uh, developed in. And that type of work, I'm sure, is a sort of collaborative activity uh, that LIBA members uh, can engage in to, to, to have that, um, that far greater reach. Because one of the things that's clear is that if you look at any of the reports about the need for increasing skills in the, the, the data areas, there's various frightening numbers being, being bounced around, quarter of a million people, half a million people with new skills needed within the next few years. We're not going to achieve those numbers through face-to-face -face classroom teaching alone. So tools like Mo MOOCs, tools like self-paced learning are going to be key to that change uh, in the future. So thanks uh, to all uh, of our speakers, to, to Jerry DeFries, uh, to Cecile Sviatek, to Thorsten Mayer, Karen Clavel, uh, Hannah Gravimovic. Um, thanks uh, to the folks uh, in, in, in LIBA uh, and, and Dios Pilot. Uh, who made this event possible. Thanks to all of you for attending uh, and uh, asking such interesting questions. Uh, I hope uh, you feel better educated and I hope that some of you feel uh, uh, able, enabled uh, to affect some small degree of change in your own organizations uh, in the area of skills. Thank you all and goodbye.